Hello and welcome to this On Geopolitics Winter Olympics special where we're putting the geopolitics into the Olympics. I'm Suzanne Rain and I'm joined this week not by my regular co-host Ali Ansari who I assume is getting ready to compete in the skeleton bob but instead by Professor Bill Hurst, Deputy Director at the Centre for Geopolitics and also Director at the Centre for Development Studies at Cambridge University. Bill is, brilliantly for our purposes, Professor in the Department of Politics and International Studies and works on China, Indonesia, East and Southeast Asia. So this is terrific, we're going to learn a lot. The Beijing Winter Olympics started this year on the 4th of February and runs to the 20th, followed then by the Paralympics between the 4th and 13th of March. China is spending approximately $4 billion hosting the Games. It won the competition to host the Games in 2015, so Beijing beat Almaty in Kazakhstan by four votes. China's had seven years, therefore, to prepare, and as we'll discover, a lot can change in seven years. Bill, it's a massive thing putting on any Olympic Games. It's a particularly difficult time to be hosting it now. Can you talk us through the political importance for President Xi of these Games, and in particular, the difficulty of hosting it during the pandemic? Thanks. Yeah, it is extremely fraught to host the Olympics during COVID in any country, as we saw last year in Japan. It's particularly at issue in China, though, because of China's much vaunted and somewhat controversial internationally zero COVID strategy. So because of that, even a single case or a couple of cases in any way linked to the games trigger all kinds of massive you know, shutdowns and, and cordons and so forth. The whole process of the games is happening inside of a closed loop, as the government likes to refer to it, as such that anyone participating in the games is not supposed to interact uh, in any way, or at least as little as possible, with anyone on the outside in the city, in any other part of the, the country from the time that they arrive until the time that they depart. There are all kinds of extensive quarantine and testing measures in place. We've all seen the photos of you know, people in hazmat suits uh, giving tests uh, to athletes as they arrive at the airport. What that also means is no one can go to the games to watch. Uh, the spectators are all sort of handpicked and brought in, quarantined, kept in a bubble, and then brought in for the events. Um, I don't know exactly who they are. At one point, there was a rumor that they were you know, sort of members of the military who were detached to go and do this as, as a matter of uh, their, their normal duty uh, or special duty to, to be the spectators in the stands. Um, so it's a very different environment from what we'd see at almost any other Olympic Games. In terms of the significance, particularly for China, Beijing is the first city to host the Olympics twice in both the winter and summer. Uh, it's not the first to host it twice, but it's the first to host both the Winter and Summer Olympics. When I first heard about the decision to put the Winter Olympics in Beijing, what surprised me the most is that they decided to put the Olympics in a city that doesn't have any snow. Right? There's actually as much or more snowfall many years in Cambridge as there is in Beijing, uh, although it's much colder there. It's, it's, it's an arid to semi-arid climate. Uh, and there just isn't a lot of snow, not only in Beijing, but in, in the mountainous areas where they're holding some of the skiing events and, and uh, I think some of the bobsled and luge and so certain other things, which are actually quite far from Beijing, more than 100 kilometers in Zhangjiakou. And they built a special high-speed train to take people there and back. That's also an arid uh, without snow. So I think it's almost entirely artificial snow, uh, which makes it an interesting sort of environment. Uh, and I think speaks to the larger issue of kind of stage managing the Olympics uh, as a whole. Uh, if we think all the way back to before 2008, and you mentioned in the intro that, that China had spent about 4 billion US dollars on the Olympics this time, by some estimates, uh, China had spent 10 times that on the Summer Olympics in 2008 and the run-up to it, including building an entire mass transit system for, for most of Beijing that hadn't been there before, uh, all these new highways, new stadiums, new facilities, many of which are now being reused. The aquatic center is now being repurposed as the speed skating arena, I think. I think it's speed skating. I'm going to stop here because there's so many things we want to go in different directions. I want to come back to the artificial snow in a minute, but just to talk about that contrast between 2008 and now, 
And I remember in 2008, China was perceived very differently, I think, by the world in 2008. It seemed to be very much on a positive trajectory in a way. And the Beijing Olympics were this tremendous occasion. It felt like China was opening up to the world, I think. Things look different now. And you can see, depending on your perspective, China's continued to to, to grow and flourish or China's become a disruptive and destabilizing influence in the world. And there are these real black clouds hanging over related to suppression of the Uyghurs, suppression of Hong Kong, desire to destabilize Taiwan and get it back. I mean, how does that feel for for President Xi, who had, you know, contrast between 2008 and, and 2022 is really stark externally, isn't it? If you look at the way we visualize the two, what's his agenda with all of this? It is important to point out that the Olympics were awarded to Beijing in this round seven years ago, rather than you know, last week. So there, there is always an arc of change from the time that a city has awarded the games until the time they actually put them on. Um, and, and that's no different this time in terms of COVID, in terms of Chinese domestic politics, or in terms of China's perception in the world. What I think really contrasts with 2008 more than the domestic political story and we can speak more about that in a moment, but is, is indeed the global perception, right? If we look at you know, the way China looked from the outside to a lot of observers in 2008 was much more open, positive, etc. Now it suddenly seems very closed, very ominous, uh, and potentially negative. But I think it's also important to keep in mind, you know, China's economic model that produced very, very high rates of economic growth to the extent it had a coherent model based on export processing manufacturing, largely to drive growth, ran its course more or less from 1994 until 2008. So right about 2008 was the the inflection point at which that model starts to not really work anymore. That was very much palpable inside China in the run-up to the games and especially in the aftermath of the games. Uh, that the only thing that saved aggregate GDP growth afterwards was massive government stimulus. There's been a sense since 2008, or there's been a perception since 2008 inside China that the economy is not what it was. Uh, And there hasn't been a new model capable of delivering the kind of sustained growth uh, on which China's been able to settle. And its attempts to find a new model have upset its relations with other parts of the world. And I don't think that that's necessarily something that a lot of observers outside China have perceived accurately. If we also then look at the sort of general political environment in terms of is it looser, is it stricter, is it more open or more closed, what always astounds me is that people think outside China often that you know Chinese politics began to become more conservative or closed sometime around 2014 or 2015. It started much earlier. It started around 2006, 2007, specifically in the run-up to the Olympics. Lots of things became harder to do. There are lots more restrictions on all kinds of previously easy activities uh, that came in around 2007. And there was a clear perception in the run-up to the 17th Party Congress in 2007, uh, as well as to the Olympics, uh, that there was a tightening of uh, all aspects of Chinese political and social life. Uh, And that tightening basically never relaxed after the games. Many people thought it might relax, but it never really did. And it's just gotten tighter and tighter. So this perceived tightening in in the last, you know, seven or eight years has actually been in train for, for quite a bit longer than that. In terms of China's foreign policy towards its neighbors, towards the rest of the world, that I don't think has actually changed very much in terms of the basic orientation goals or indeed overarching uh, strategy. What has changed are some of the tactics. So what, what happened in 2008, besides China's economy clearly beginning to run out of steam in terms of the model that had been so useful before, is that China began to perceive that other countries, particularly the United States, but others as well, were no longer what they had been, at least in relative terms and maybe in absolute terms, uh, with respect to economic power, soft power, or indeed military power. And so many in the Chinese foreign policy establishment perceived that a window had begun to open in which a more assertive uh, or directly assertive or confrontational policy by China could be more useful uh, than the previously less assertive or, or confrontational policy that had been essentially China's modus operandi since, since the 70s. So that did change after about 2008, but not because of the Olympics. 
right? It wasn't that the Olympics triggered that. So I think people outside China looked at the Olympics. They saw it as a very sort of positive, open development. If you'd been watching from inside, you'd see that it really wasn't that. It was actually a sort of closing down of what had been more open in 2008. And that you know, sort of closed, closing down has continued uh, a pace all the way through until today, as the economy is also largely sputtered. And what's really changed is that the, the foreign policy tactics have, have morphed to being more assertive and confrontational. And we've got that real physical manifestation of the closing down with, as you said, the fact that the games have artificial spectators, everybody's being doused in antiseptic the whole time. And the boycott. Now, this isn't a Olympic boycott on the scale of Moscow 1980, but it is nonetheless a boycott of some Western states because of China's human rights abuses, particularly Uyghurs, particularly Hong Kong. And it's an interesting set of countries, actually, isn't it? Because it's some of the usual suspects, the US, the UK, Australia, Canada, and then India, Lithuania, Kosovo, Belgium, Denmark, Estonia, Japan. Does anybody care about the boycott? I don't know, actually. Uh, I mean, the, the, there are two aspects of, of what you've just said that I, I think are worth mentioning. One is the, the sort of general issue of the artifice of the Olympic Games, which, you know, yes, we have artificial snow this time, but in the months and years before 2008, when the Olympic Committee members would come to visit Beijing, there would be all these restrictions to make the air cleaner for those few days. And and sometimes they'd even send people out to paint the brown grass green along the fringes of the highway that, that the, the Olympic motorcade would travel on um, so that it would look as though the, the, the city were healthier environmentally than it really was. And that that's not just Beijing. It's not just 2008. It's not just now. A lot of places have done things like this for the Olympics uh, in one way or another. So I think that there's a whole aspect of sort of artifice and spectacle to the Olympics, which is important and maybe height, particularly in China, particularly at this time. Yeah, it's worth just, I'll give you a stat on that. Um, I believe 1.2 million cubic metres of artificial snow is being used because it doesn't snow. It's also a tremendous amount of water and other chemicals that are being spent on this. But it, it, the, the snow, yes, but in terms of boycotts, um, which are not happening because of the snow. What's also interesting to remark on that is that no country has been as prolific in boycotting the Olympic Games than China itself. Right. If if we look back in time from 1924 until 1976, China was represented at the Olympics by the Olympic Committee that had been organized originally by the Republic of China government, uh, which was in power in 1924 uh, throughout all of China, but uh, Taiwan and, and, and some other areas that were still colonized. But the Republic of China government's uh, Olympic Committee continued then to send uh, delegations in the name of the Republic of China until 1976. Uh, in 1952, if I'm not mistaken, both the Republic of China and the People's Republic of China sent delegations sort of at the last minute. I think if I remember the story correctly, the, the mainland uh, Chinese, the People's Republic of China delegation arrived late to the game such that they could only compete in one event in which they didn't do very well. In part because there was no easy transportation from China to Helsinki in 1952. And so it took a very long time just to get people there, let alone decide to go. But after that, then 1956, uh, the PRC delegation boycotted over Taiwan, as in 1960. In 1964, China was joined by, um, or mainland China, PRC was joined by uh, Indonesia and North Korea in boycotting because there was some issue about the Olympic Committee censuring Indonesia for having hosted a kind of rival to the Olympic Games for third world and progressive forces. And then the, the People's Republic of China delegation boycotted all the way through to 1976 over the continuing representation of the Republic of China delegation at the Games. In 1979, I believe, if I'm not mistaken on the year, might have been a bit earlier, a resolution was adopted by the IOC to essentially throw out the Republic of China. Pierre Elliott Trudeau tried to do that at the 1976 Games, uh, and then later that was done formally by the International Olympic Committee, which was meant then to invite the People's Republic of China to be the main delegation. Uh, and then in 1980, the PRC decided to boycott the Moscow Olympics over the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. 
which they opposed strongly. Uh, and they joined basically the US, much of Europe and so on in doing that. And then only by 1984, was the current compromise worked out in which the PRC sent the Chinese delegation from its Olympic Committee and the Republic of China and Taiwan sent a delegation under the banner and logo of Chinese Taipei, which is, continues to be the case to today. So it's really only in the, in the fairly recent past that China has sent a delegation to the Games regularly other than the Republic of China delegations that were being sent. Uh, in the 1950s and 60s and 70s. Well, that's fascinating. I, I wasn't aware of that, and it seems they might have... Well, it just shows people don't care that much about boycotts, I suppose. No. And also, <laughs> well, and maybe China cares more about boycotts than, than, mm. than others. It was quite interesting to, to sort of reflect which way it goes. But also, they come late to the party, but then they've obviously embraced it. I was struck, I've been looking at the medal table, um, looking in vain for some British <laughs> anything on the medal table. And, and I kept seeing ROC and I immediately think, oh, Republic of China, Taiwan's doing well. And of course, it's not Taiwan, is it? It's the Russian Olympics Committee. Which I think it has to compete under that logo because of doping problems in Russia over a long period of time for which it's been censured. So, but Taiwan is competing in these Winter Olympics. I believe so, yes. In a small number of categories. I think in one of the alpine skiing events, and I think one of the luge events too, at least. Maybe also speed skating, if I, if I recall correctly. We wish them well with that. So, Bill, you've talked very convincingly about well, the changes in China. What is it that needs to happen in these games for President Xi to see them as being a success? And the sub-question to that is about the medals table. So does it matter who wins? And I noticed that um, you know China's now fielding 171 athletes. It's hired apparently coaches from more than 50 foreign countries to to sort of boost their medal winning hopes. Is winning medals a measure of success for President Xi, or is it actually something completely other that he's after? Um, I think both. I, I think what would clearly be a measure of failure would be some kind of major incident at the games, which everyone hopes won't happen. Uh, whether it's security incident or, or, or otherwise. Also would be if uh, if there were, say, a major outbreak of COVID in the Olympic Village, that, that would be a clear failure uh, for, for the Chinese government, uh, which also no one hopes that that happens. So, you know, as, as long as those failures don't happen, simply putting on the games and managing the spectacle will be a success. It's really a spectacle for domestic political display. Um, and I think... All Olympics have been like that. That's not unique to China. It's been true. Certainly, I remember noticing that first about the Olympics in 1984 in the Los Angeles Games. And actually, even before that, in 1980, the Winter Olympics, the hockey final between the United States and the Soviet Union resulted in a kind of crude, not even video game, but sort of domed foosball table game uh, of ice hockey uh, in which the teams were the United States and the Soviet Union that was ubiquitous in video arcades in the United States during the early 1980s and mid-1980s, uh, and with tremendous Cold War overtones to all of this. Uh, so I think the, the political significance of domestic spectacle should not be underestimated in hosting the Olympics, you know, all the way back to 1936. And Hitler had that very, very well worked out in those Olympics. Prior to that, I'm not sure, because I honestly don't know how much Olympics before 1936 were featured in mass media, whether that be a radio or newsreels or anything else, I, I just don't know. But my, my perception is that they were not, you know, sort of major spectacles the way that they became after that. You know, I think if the, the, the domestic spectacle succeeds, it will be a success, regardless of what happens in terms of the sports outcomes. In terms of the sports outcomes, there are some interesting facets of China's team that have caused some interesting and uh, sort of thorny debates inside and outside China. One is the, the men's hockey uh, starting line uh, is composed of players, very few of whom have lived in China for very long uh, or had any other connection to China. I think some of them are playing professionally in Chinese hockey leagues now, but most of them seem to be from North America, which I think has proven controversial, possibly Europe as well. I'm not sure, actually. I don't, don't know enough about the players or the team. That's one thing that's been controversial outside China and even inside to some extent. People sort of remarking, why does the Chinese hockey team not contain any Chinese players? Also, uh, two 
women in the games uh, have popped up uh, in Chinese social media and outside China as controversial in different ways, uh, or as, as not even necessarily controversial. Uh, one is a skier by the name of Eileen Gu, uh, who just won a gold medal and is apparently the, the top skier at big air freestyle skiing, big something air. like this, yeah. I think if Ali Ansari wasn't doing Skeleton Bob, he'd definitely be doing <laughs> Big Air. Uh, it, it, it looks quite ridiculous challenging. <laughs> well, it, it looks very, very challenging. I, I wouldn't want to try it. It's a sort of ski jump combined with aerial acrobatics. But apparently she won a gold medal in this, maybe more than one, uh, and has been a media darling in China, despite having been born and grown up in California. There are speculations, at least, about her citizenship, because China, of course, does not allow dual or multiple citizenship, whether she's a Chinese citizen or a U.S. citizen. There's some you know, concern in some quarters around that, but in the domestic media sphere, at least, she's sort of the face of the games and the, the most featured athlete, probably the single most featured athlete in, in the Chinese media and, and social media online discussion in a very positive way, almost entirely positive, nothing much negative about her. Also, but pres- presumably, Bill. Sorry to interrupt, but presumably the package is great. You know, mm. she's she's a terrific young female yeah. athlete. It must help that she's essentially being poached from America. Uh, well, she's also a fashion model. Uh, she's in a bunch of uh, print and sort of billboard advertising uh, in China, uh, at least maybe elsewhere too. Uh, so I think that also helped that she was famous before. And it's sort of very easy to then feature her uh, in, a, in a media context. I don't know the extent to which she's poached from America is really a sort of an open question, right? Because, again, people aren't sure if she's given up U.S. citizenship or not. Technically, she shouldn't have Chinese citizenship if she's not given up U.S. citizenship. But she did used to compete for... That, uh, that I'm not sure. I'm not sure if she ever, because she's quite young. She's only 18 or 19 years old. I don't know if she's been in the Olympics, certainly, for the U.S. Team. She does say publicly that she's planning to go to Stanford next year to start university. So again, sort of cementing the fact that she's really in and from California rather than China. So yet that never comes up uh, in the sort of domestic political uh, or, or media discussion inside China, as opposed to a figure skater named Zhu Yi, who is also from California, but who has given up U.S. citizenship, apparently, at least from what I read, uh, and taken Chinese citizenship exclusively, moved full-time to China for training and potentially, I assume, for the rest of her life, and has been just savaged in the social media space and even in some of the the mainstream media in China, in part because she fell down during her routine and, and didn't do very well. And therefore, you know, she was very upset and then everyone was upset with her. But some of the attacks against her have been quite nasty, even xenophobic in tone, uh, in a way that never came up with, with Eileen Gu or, or indeed the hockey players uh, in, in the Chinese media landscape, which is very odd uh, to me and, and, and something worth further study. Do you know, Bill, it's a reminder that we started this talking about geopolitics and, and the way that the Olympics always bring sport and geopolitics together. But I think we're, we're finishing it talking about individuals. And these are athletes. They're not people who desire, in many cases, to have any geopolitical position on anything. But it's almost impossible to avoid being drawn in it, into it in some way. And the cases, these examples that you've given, show the very human dilemmas of dual national, or sort of, you know, Americans with Chinese heritage who who find themselves caught between dueling superpowers and then this sort of crucible of sports that says, well, you have to, you have to choose which side you're on is, is very interesting. And then even British athletes who go there, the question about whether or not you make any kind of statement about China and human rights and whether not making a statement is, is a betrayal or a compromise. I think all of those things are... They, you know, it's not a new thing for athletes to, to have to have a political position on these things. But this Olympics has really brought it all to the fore because of the focus on China's human rights abuses. From my understanding of it, there's very significant Chinese efforts to make sure that there aren't going to be any protests at the Games on behalf of the athletes. Is that? Yes, that, that, that's that been my perception as well. Uh, even 
to the extent that I've seen media reports of pretty direct threats by the Chinese government toward the athletes to say that, you know, while at the Olympics, you're not exempt from Chinese law, uh, which prohibits you know, certain kinds of political activity. Uh, and so if you're going to you know, engage in a protest, prepare to be prosecuted. I, mean, I don't think they said it exactly in those words, but that did seem very clearly to be the message. Uh, it would be interesting to see, and I have not followed closely enough to tell whether this has happened, to see if any of the athletes were to engage in any form of protest while at the Games, what the reaction would be. Uh, I think certainly there'd be a media blackout of that inside China. Wouldn't be very easy to see that or learn of that that at all um, if you're watching from inside China. Outside China and the rest of the world, I think it would attract quite a bit of media attention if that were to happen. And I don't know how it would be perceived outside China, how much it would filter through into China, probably not much, and whether it would result in a, in a clear reaction from the Chinese government not. Another factor in this is, I suspect, unlike what I understand to have been the case in most previous Olympics, where athletes compete in their event and then will very often stay on until the conclusion of the Games, and you know, the Olympic Village becomes sort of a party town and, uh, and, and also potentially a political platform, my sense at these Games is that the athletes are very strongly encouraged to leave as soon as they're done competing. In theory, to prevent COVID, uh, from spreading, but there's there's also not much to do in the Olympic Village. There's very limited space for the kind of activity that may have been a useful uh, staging area for kind of political protests that we saw previously. If we saw something happen in the actual event, someone wearing something uh, or you know gestures, uh, the closed fist salutes or, or kneeling or something like this that happened you know, during a medal ceremony. If something like that were to happen, I don't know what the reaction would be. It would be very, I, again, I think there'd be a media blackout inside China. Uh, I don't know how much any reports outside would feed back in. And I don't know what the reaction of the Chinese government would be, but it'd be very interesting to see. And actually, by the time this podcast goes out, we're sort of predicting something which may or may not happen. The role of the IOC, of course, is not negligible in this sort of circumstance, although they seem to very much be behind the Chinese line on it. Bill, we're going to wrap up there, but I suppose we won't really know until the athletes who travel to China start travelling home what their perception of the event has been. And it will be interesting to hear from them, whether they come back from China with a sense of it having been a fun, positive experience or not. So essentially, your point about the artifice is a really important one, because they will have had a real experience, I suppose. And what that is will be interesting to hear when they... I, I think that's true. I also think it would be particularly interesting to hear from athletes who've been at multiple Olympics uh, in different countries or at different times. Uh, who might then be particularly well placed as well to parse how much of what made the Olympics this time different was really because of COVID, how much of it was really because of China, uh, rather than being in a different country at a different time uh, for the same kind of game. Somebody who's only been to this Olympics may have a skewed perception. Bill, thank you very much. We'll be glued to our TV screens for the remainder of a couple of weeks. I'm expecting China to do well in the medal table. I'm expecting America to have a late run of success, <laughs> a strong battle for the title, and maybe it'll go somewhere completely different. Thank you, Bill, for your time, and um, we'll have you on again to talk about other aspects of China in due course. Great, thank you. Thank you, bye.